常感谢大家，非常感谢大家来参加我们 STEM Ivy 和 Ivy Circle 联合推出的升学规划讲座。希望本次讲座让大家收获满满。大家有任何问题，可以直接联系我们，联系方式都在我们的屏幕上。也欢迎大家进入讲座群，讲座部分的答疑和录像回放会在群里分享。本次讲座由康奈尔大学的前招生官 John 主讲。John, your turn. Can you hear me? Okay. Can I just get a confirmation? You guys can hear me? Okay. Okay, great. Okay, good. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the introduction once again. I am John Morganelli, a former Ivy League admissions director and founder of Ivy League Consulting LLC. I'm author, also the author of a newly released book entitled "Growing Ivy: How to Crack the Code on Elite College Admissions." My work has been featured on CBS, NBC, and Fox, amongst a host of other media outlets. Oh, I did not realize I'm not screen sharing. Hold on one second. Let's make sure that I'm screen sharing correctly. Hold on. Okay, we are all set. My apologies. So, ladies and gentlemen, this presentation is entitled "Why Universities Don't Admit Well-Rounded Applicants." My hope is to provide insight into the types of activities, engagement that highly selective universities value most. And this topic is complex, so I will try to go slowly and really focus on the points that are really important. But before we jump into college admissions, I want to take a moment to describe why I think I'm one of the most qualified people in the United States to talk about college admissions. I've been a senior admissions officer at three different institutions. I've personally reviewed over 30,000 applications for admissions over 10 years. I was invited to provide feedback at the University of Pennsylvania on their new committee-based evaluation application process. That's the way they actually review applications before they rolled it out to their staff. I was invited down to review that process. I had the very unique opportunity of hosting the IB Plus conference while I was the director of admissions at Cornell University. For those of you who don't know, the Ivy Plus conference is every Ivy League school, plus Stanford, MIT, and Duke. And during this period of time, I had the opportunity to review all of the aspects of the way they engage in admissions during a three-day enrollment summit. Very unique opportunity. And then finally, I was appointed as an Ivy League admissions director at the age of 32, supervising a staff of faculty members. Okay, so let's jump into the Meat of this conversation. I want to start by discussing the aspects of the application that really impact decision making. This is the most important. We have to understand what is it the admissions officers are actually looking at. Let's start with standardized tests, SAT or ACTs. Standardized tests, although they're changing now because of COVID, they primarily serve as a filtering function, and they filter students by ethnicity, by geography. By prospective major, meaning that if an Asian student, for example, by ethnicity, has an SAT or an ACT below the 50th percentile of the school they're applying to, very likely they will be rejected. Quite honestly, regardless of what else is in their application, because it is in fact a filtering function, and so if you score below the, the filtered number, you would be in a difficult position to earn an offer of admission. So that's your standardized test, and that's usually the very first thing. That serves as a filtering function in college admissions. The second thing that admissions officers look at is your curriculum, and when they're looking at their curriculum, they're asking themselves the question: Does this curriculum support the student's described interest? So, for example, the student says they want to study engineering, but they never took calculus. That would illustrate to the reader that it does not, their curriculum does not represent their Their identified academic interest, and thus very likely would re be rejected. So first, it's standardized test, then it's curriculum. 
After the curriculum, we look at academic rigor. The question we ask ourselves is, did the student challenge him or herself within the context of the described interest? So, for example, let's just say a student applied as a political science student, and they took eight AP courses, but most of those eight AP courses were in STEM areas, and the remaining two were in social sciences and humanities. In this situation, the student's curriculum, academic rigor aspect of the curriculum does not fit what they told us the student was interested in. They said they were interested in political science and most of their academic rigor, their advanced level courses, the AP courses are in STEM classes. That is, in, as, is an inconsistency and very likely a student like that would be rejected. The fourth is your in-school extracurricular activities. The question the admissions officers are asking themselves is, did the student explore the foundational engagement opportunities in their school? And does that fit the area of academic interest? For example, let's say the student says they want to study history, but they're part of the computer science coding club, the machine learning club, and the robotics club. Again, regardless of what else is in their application, their in-school extracurricular activities do not support what they told us they, they're interested in studying, right? They said history and their engagement clearly is in the realm of computer science or engineering. And as such, a student like that would be rejected. So we have four, the first four things, your standardized test filtering function, your curriculum, does it represent what the student says they want to study? The academic rigor, the, the advanced level courses the student's taking, are they in the right areas? And then the in-school extracurricular activities, are those activities supporting the academic direction the student told us they're interested in? That's the first four. Then we move on. Number five is structured out of school extracurricular activities. We ask the, the question, did the students supplement their in-school engagement, those in-school clubs and organizations with outside of school engagement that is related to the area of academic interest? For example, the applicant says they love sociology, but they never engaged in a camp program course or anything outside of school related to sociology. I wouldn't say they're absolutely rejected, but you note I say they're likely rejected. There is some expectation that a student will explore their area of academic interest outside of their school. That is the structured out of school extracurricular activities. Number six is summer programs. Summer is a very valuable time. College admissions officers recognize during the school year, students are very busy. And during the summer, they are often busy as well, but there is more flexibility. And there is some expectation that the student is furthering their exploration in their area of interest during the summer. If the student never engaged in exploration of their area of interest during the summer, very likely they would be rejected. And then finally, research and what I refer to as unstructured exploration. This is generally the end. This is, this is the culmination of all the stuff we talked about before. And what we're asking here is, did the student get out there in the world and engage in original exploration? Did they do, engage in research in a wet lab? Maybe they engaged in research outside of a lab. Maybe they were just out there exploring their community and that ended up in them writing a, an article for their local newspaper. This is outside of school engagement that illustrates their ability to explore without someone guiding them every single step of the way. At highly selective schools, if you have none of that on your resume, again, likely rejected. Okay, now that we have a general understanding of the areas of consideration during application review, we'll jump into what this presentation is all about. Remember, the title of this presentation is why universities do not admit well-rounded applicants. In order to understand this statement, we need to start with understanding how universities are structured. We'll use Cornell University, where I was the Director of Admissions in the College of Arts and Sciences, as the case study to develop a better understanding of the university structure, specifically at national research institutions. So Cornell, Penn, those are national research institutions your smaller liberal arts colleges like Amherst and Swarthmore, those are liberal arts colleges. So there, there's a distinction there. At this moment in time, we're talking about national research institutions. 
And at Cornell University, there are seven different colleges underneath the Cornell University structure. We, the seven colleges at Cornell University are the College of Arts and Sciences, which is the largest, the College of Engineering, the SC, SC Johnson College of Business, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, the College of Human Ecology, the College of Industrial and Labor Relations, and the Dyson School of Hotel Administration. You may apply to only one of these colleges at a time. And if you want to transfer from one college to another, arts and sciences to engineering, for example, it's a new application process. And there is no guarantee that the transfer will be successful. Unlike transferring to other colleges, okay, so let's just say you're in the College of Arts and Sciences and you wanna to move to the College of Engineering, that's limited. It's a reapplication process. But if we're talking about changing majors within college, right, that's different. Now we're changing programs within the same college. Once you are admitted to a college, the student has access to all of the majors in that particular college. And you may move freely amongst those majors. Let me say that again. Although you cannot easily transfer from one college to another under a underneath a university structure, once you are accepted into your college, you have access to all of the majors in that college. And the diversity of those majors can be rather significant. For example, in the College of Arts and Sciences at Cornell, there's over 90 different programs from which to choose. And there are things like art, astrobiology, computer science, economics, physics, public policy, statistical science. There's a wide variety of academic programs in that college. And so the key here is making sure that you choose the right college early on in this process. If you remember back to the beginning of this presentation, I noted that one of the areas the admissions officers are evaluating is the student's curriculum. Remember, I noted that the question the reader will ask is, does this curriculum support the student's described interest? By described interest, I basically mean the student's prospective major. The student's prospective major is simply the major they listed on the application for admission. We refer to that as the, as the prospective major because they are not actually in the major until they declare that major and are accepted into that major by the department. This typically happens during the student's sophomore year of college. This is an important distinction to remember. What I'm saying is, if an applicant writes down computer science, they are simply notifying the university as what they plan to do. They are not actually accepted into the major until sophomore year of college. It's also important to note that although they are not accepting the students into the major, rather they are accepting the students into the college, they are at the very least taking note of the student's prospective major during the review process. And similar students get compared to similar students. Thus, if an applicant identifies themselves as computer science, we will compare them to all of the other applicants who identify themselves as computer science. And if they get accepted, right? So now they're accepted. They are simply a prospective computer science major. And as a prospective computer science major, they can declare the computer science major during their sophomore year, sophomore year of college, or they can change their mind and declare a different major in that same college. Any of the programs that are in, their in that college would be accessible to them. Okay, so let's tie this all up. Why does this all matter? First, Whatever major I put in my application, I'm gonna be compared to all of the other applicants who put the same major. Some of the majors have significantly more accomplished applicants than others. For example, if you identify yourself as pre-med or as computer science, these are highly competitive areas and the students in these areas typically have the highest standardized test scores, the most academic rigor, right? The most advanced level classes, in the highest grades overall. And if you note at the bottom of the slide, we look at Cornell as an example. Not only is the, the ability and the quality of the students different, but the total number of applicants is very different from major to major. If you take a look at the first one, you see biology at Cornell in the College of Arts and Sciences. My last year as the director of admissions, 
we had 4,728 students who identified themselves as biology. We had 1,795 that identified themselves as computer science. But we only had 92 that identified themselves as information science. So anyone can recognize, even if we take away the idea that some of these applicant pools will be more competitive than the others because of the quality of the student. If we just look at the numbers, anyone can recognize that clearly it would be easier to apply as an information science student with 92 other applicants than as a biology student with 4,728 other applicants. Again, once I'm accepted, right? Let's say I'm accepted as an information science student. Once I'm accepted, in theory, I could easily identify uh, declare myself a computer science student or even a biology student at once I'm actually admitted into the college at the university. So based on all of that, based on the fact that you're only identifying a prospective major, I have the ability to change majors within my college once I get there, my goals as a, as a consultant are rather simple. First and foremost, I want to determine underneath the university structure, I want to determine all the possible areas a student may want to study. I wanna make sure that I get the student into the right college underneath the university structure, right? For example, just because it's easier to get in as a data science student, that might work if all of the programs you're interested in live or exist in the College of Arts and Sciences. But, if you're really interested in mechanical engineering and mechanical engineering is in the engineering college, that strategy wouldn't work. So our first goal here is to identify the universe of possibility. What does the student possibly want to study at the university level? Once we've identified that, we find a major that in my opinion is less competitive, but still similar enough that the student can spend their high school career taking courses and exploring the things they actually enjoy learning. For example, although it is true, a student could apply as a Greek literature major, and that major would be much easier because there are not many students who are interested in Greek literature. And even once they got in, they could very easily switch to computer science once they're accepted. The problem with applying as a Greek literature student is that in order for the reader to actually believe that the student wants to study Greek literature, they would need curriculum to reflect that. They would need their extracurricular activities to reflect that. They would need their engagement outside of school to reflect their interest in Greek literature. And so although it may be easier to apply as a Greek literature student, it, in my opinion, would be a waste of the student's time and resources while they're in high school. So it doesn't make sense to simply find the easiest program to apply to. What we're actually interested in doing is finding programs that are similar to the student's specific interest, but a little less competitive. So let me give you two examples. Let's say, for example, the student is interested in applying as a pre-med student, super competitive. What I do with my clients is I take pre-med students, and I move them from prospective pre-med to prospective public health. Why would I do that? Well, first and foremost, as it relates to pre-med, almost every single smart kid who likes science in high school at some point thinks to themselves, maybe I should become a doctor. And if they don't think about that, their parents think about it for them. And so it becomes super competitive with every smart kid thinking at some point, maybe I should become a physician. But when we start to think about public health, a lot of students don't really know what public health is at the high school level. And because of that fact, because students are not exposed to the program of public health at the high school level, the benefits are it's easier to get in. The second is it's quite flexible, right? Because when we talk about public health, there's a health aspect that it connects to, to your STEM and healthcare interests. But there's also public policy aspects, economics aspects, philosophy, sociology, psychology, all of those things fall under public health. So it's very flexible. It allows us to connect a lot of different experiences the student had to this area of interest. The third thing that's really interesting is that you can engage in somewhat similar preparation 
to pre-med, right? So if a student is really dying to become a physician and they've been shadowing at a local hospital, we could still use that experience if the student was interested in public health. We couldn't use that example or that experience if the student was trying to identify themselves as a Greek literature student. And again, the most important part, you can easily move, right? When I say move, it's simply just filling out a form because you're in the right college already from public health to pre-med immediately after you've been accepted. A second example of this would be computer science. Super competitive area. What do we do with computer science students? We typically take a computer science student and we move them to data or information science, which is less competitive. Again, benefits is it's easier to get in. It's significantly more flexible, right? Because we can relate something like data or information science to things in computer science, but also things in like sociology and business and maybe even psychology. And again, you can engage in similar preparation. So maybe you took a coding class, right? Well, we can still use that if you're engaging, if you're applying as a data or information science student. Whereas if you applied as a Greek literature student in the example I gave you earlier, we would not be able to use any of that computer science related engagement in high school as evidence. So it's a simple minor move from something like pre-med pre to public health, something like computer science to data science. Now, the key here that's really, really important to recognize is because a lot of students don't really know what public health is, because they don't really know exactly what data science is, because high schools do not provide as much engagement opportunity in either of those areas, it is really important that the student have a deep understanding of what, of what data science is or what public health is so that when they're building their application for admission, they can speak eloquently and intellectually about this area of academia so that the reader understands that the student is really excited, engaged, and understands what this area of academia is all about. That takes effort, it takes time, it takes energy, and in many cases, it takes a mentor to help a student walk through the different aspects of the program so they have a deep, true understanding of what it is they're applying to so that the reader feels that when it's time to actually apply to college. One of the saddest things I see is all of the time, energy, and resources that are spent on activities that the student does not value because they think it's going to help them get into top universities. The reason it's sad is that many of the things they are told to do are not actually valued by the universities. Most of the reasons that students are doing all these different things is because they want to appear well-rounded. Guidance counselors, teachers, parents, they're all saying the same thing. Colleges want well-rounded students. Let me say it here, they are wrong. Colleges do not want well-rounded students. They want a well-rounded class. And there is a significant difference. That means that universities often seek to admit great physics students, great violinists, great historians, great computer scientists, and together they create a great well-rounded class. While the individually well-rounded students are often left on the outside looking in. In my opinion, there are basically two types of students. They are well-rounded and they are focused. Let's take a look at an example of a well-rounded student versus a focused student. The applicant interest in both of these instances is going to be pre-med. And in both of these instances, the strategic move would be to take this pre-med student and move them to public health. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, in the environmental public health focused student first. The first thing you note that they were involved in is Science Olympiad. This is a foundational engagement organization in school. Nothing wrong with it. Good place to be, whether you're pre-med or public health. The second one you see is the Environmental Awareness Club. As you can see, that's very clearly connected to their interest in environmental public health. The third thing is local county health bureau research about minority health. The student went out, reached out to a local public health bureau and started engaging in an inquiry, interviewed a few people, specifically as related to minority health. 
not necessarily specifically related to their interest in environmental public health, but it's very clearly connected to public health as a whole. And then finally, you see the student wrote an op-ed in the local newspaper about local water quality issues after researching that in their own community. Again, as you can see, very clearly connected to public health and very clearly in this instance, connected to environmentally focused public health. This first student, as you can see, they only had 240 total hours. Actually, you see the final one, they, they also published that research. They did faculty-led research and published that in a journal. I apologize, that was the last one. And the total number of hours that the student engaged in was 240 hours. Let's take a look at the second student. This is also a public health student that came to me. And this, this is your traditionally well-rounded student. The student was also part of Science Olympiad, uh, 75 hours. Because they were originally pre-med, they also engaged in local hospital, sh hospital shadowing. They engaged in a biology-focused wet lab research. Now, the local hospital shadowing is okay. It sounds like pre-med. You can probably use it for public health. The biology-focused wet lab research really does not help too much as it relates to public health unless whatever that research was is very clearly related to healthcare. And even then, it'll, it'll be a little bit questionable. Biology-focused wet lab research really feels like a prospective biology major, but we might be able to use it. And then you see all of the red. The red, the highlighted red activities are things that quite frankly, although it's nice that they do it, add literally almost no real value as it relates to identifying why you would be a good student to add to this specific department. And to be clear, that's what these universities are asking. They're saying to themselves, what do you wanna study? Why do you wanna study it? How did you explore it? And how will you contribute to this specific area of academia in our institution? So as you look at their activities, they're treasurer of Habitat for Humanity, nice, but doesn't really connect to public health in any specific way. They're president of the peer tutoring club. Again, nice, but doesn't tell us anything about what they're gonna do as it relates to public health. They're captain of the tennis team. To be quite honest with you, nobody cares that the students play sports unless they plan to play that sport in college. So, you know, all the hours that are put into athletics, and I love athletics more than anyone really, but the fact of the matter is, college admissions officers don't care if you're captain of the tennis team or captain of the football team or dance unless you plan to do those things at the college level. Piano, the students spend 75, year, 75 hours a year in piano. Again, unless you plan to apply as a music major, piano will have a very, very little impact on college admissions. And then finally, this student was captain of the fencing team, which again, under athletics, has almost no impact. The student below, although from many perspectives, uh, as a well-rounded student, has been very engaged, doing a lot of different things, that's a very typical waitlisted student at highly selective schools. Whereas the student above, who really did less overall, the, because most of their engagement was targeted towards one specific area, it's easier for the reader to understand what the student will contribute. That student is significantly more likely to be accepted. And these are real examples. These two students played, applied to the exact same institution. One was accepted, one was waitlisted. And I think it's a clear uh, illustration of what happens to well-rounded students in this process. So if colleges value focused students more than well-rounded students, how do you go about becoming a focused student? Most importantly, in my opinion, you have to start early. If we look at the example on the slide, we have two students with exactly the same academic statistics. Student A is the typically well-rounded applicant. And when it's time to apply to college, this is what they typically sound like. They say stuff like this. I like most of the STEM areas. I love robotics clubs, so I'm considering engineering. I love coding. So I'm considering computer science. I'm really good at math. So I've considered becoming a math major. And my parents really want me to become a doctor. So I also considered biology pre-med. That kid is waitlisted over and over and over again because we don't know what the student's going to do when they get here. Student B is more focused as they've been creating depth since ninth grade in an area that will help them get into college that they want. A student who starts early typically sounds like this. 
I like most of the STEM areas, but I decided in ninth grade that most of the things I want to study reside in a college of arts and sciences. Thus, I chose my prospective major in ninth grade, data science. And most everything I've done since then has been to build depth of exploration in data science. Except dance, I love dance, that's for me. Once I get in, I may change my mind to computer science or even pre-med. And that's okay, because both of those majors are in the College of Arts and Sciences, so I know I will have access to them. In the meantime, I'm enjoying learning how to collect, analyze, and make decisions with data. That student very likely will be accepted because the depth of investigation is there because they started early. As you can imagine, if one student decides in 11th grade and one student decides in ninth grade, the student in ninth grade is two full years to build evidence that they're interested in this specific area and to build evidence that they're ready to contribute in this specific area. It's very difficult to overcome that head start of a student deciding so early. Before we finish up and I start to take questions, I wanna take a moment to provide a bit of insight into my process and my work. First and foremost, I think it's really important that students, parents, and certainly students working with me, we document our plan. Mine is specifically is designed to read like the admissions officers voting sheets at the most selective schools in the country. The voting sheets are broken up into areas, high school grades and academic rigor, standardized tests, in-school extracurricular activities, out-of-school extracurricular activities, structured academic exploration, and self-directed academic community engagement. Once we identify the different areas, we build an academic roadmap based on the information I acquire from meeting with my clients. We provide our clients with roadmaps that will help the students understand how to create layered engagement evidence. That is fundamentally important because most of the time, the reason students don't make progress building evidence is they don't understand the plan. They don't understand all of the moving pieces. They don't, under they don't understand how to layer engagement. They don't know what comes first, what's in the middle, and what comes last. Once you lay it out for them, if you show them all of the pieces of the puzzle, all of a sudden the path becomes clear and students get excited because they understand when they're spending their time doing specific things, they understand the value. They understand what they're doing and why it will benefit them in the long run. Next, once the plan is created, right? And once the student understands the plan and we start to layer engagement from an early age, illustrating the depth and specificity of their interest, then we get into the process of how do we turn this into a product that will help them get into the best college. We first, we start with the college list. When we start with the college list, we provide feedback discussing the likelihood of earning an offer based on experience that quite frankly, almost no one else can offer. We benchmark our students and we say, okay, here's your academic rigor, here's your curriculum, here's your standardized test, here's your engagement, here's what you look like from an objective perspective. Now let's compare that to what a Cornell student might look like. Let's compare that to what a Virginia Tech student might look like. Let's compare that to what a UC Berkeley student might, might look like. And now the student has an understanding of what do they, how do they look within the context of the competitive space to which they are applying. Next, we design the application strategy. Students who are applying from high income areas or applying from majority ethnicities, Asian students or white students, you must have a strong application strategy. Early decision one, early decision two, early action, restrictive early action, regular decision, rolling admission, these are all different ways of applying. Each one of them has a unique advantage, advantage and disadvantage. It is really important that students go through this, understand the differences between ED1 and ED2, early action, restrictive early action, and develop a comprehensive application strategy. Just so you guys know, as it relates to early decision, early decision 
is very, very, very important for Asian and white students. The reason for this is that in early decision, and for those of you who are not familiar, early decision is the binding commitment. That before you actually press submit, you're getting, you're signing a document, your parents are signing a document, your guidance counselor is signing a document saying, if I am accepted, I will enroll at this institution. That's what early decision is. It's a commitment to attend the institution if you are accepted. Why would you ever do that? Well, the reason you do that is because it's significantly easier to get in early decision than it is to get in regular decision. Why is that? Well, the college and universities created early decision. They did this in the late 1970s. And the reason they created early decision is they wanted to lower their acceptance rate. As you know, all of these elite institutions, they all want lower acceptance rates. That's why Stanford will identify their acceptance rate as 4.6% instead of rounding it up to 5%, because they're in fact proud of the fact that it's below 5% and they want to illustrate that. So what does that mean? That means that all of these colleges are trying to lower their acceptance rate. The only way you can do it is by ensuring on the college side that whomever it is you accept actually enrolls. So who are those students? Those are the early decision students, right? The ED students are saying, if you accept me, I will enroll. And so now the students have given the colleges a real reason to take them, even if they're not absolutely blown away, amazed by the student. The, the even if part is, well, they might not be the most amazing, most interesting student I've ever seen, but I know they're gonna come if I accept them and that will have a benefit to our institution as it lowers the acceptance rate. If we look at the University of Pennsylvania, for example, UPenn is literally taking over 50% of all of their students in early decision. So by the time, it's actually 53%. So by the time you get to regular decision, only 47% of all the spaces are left. And imagine for a moment in early decision, who do you think is applying early decision, right? If you are applying to a to University of Pennsylvania and the cost is $55,000 a year and you have to commit in advance of knowing whether you've been accepted, who do you think does that? Generally, it's students who come from high income areas who are overwhelmingly Asian and white. And what that means is that all of those types of students are being admitted in early decision. By the time you get to regular decision, this, the college has already filled its class with all of those types of students. Now they're looking for the types of students that were not in the early decision pool. And those are your underrepresented minorities. Those are your VIP students. Those are your students who are interested in studying kind of underserved academic areas. These are your legacy students. What you need to do is be aware of what type of student am I? Where are the students, the students who look like me? When are they applying? Are they applying an early decision? Are they applying in regular decision? Are they applying in early action? And take all of that into account as it relates to how you apply to college. I suggest starting with an early decision two strategy. You jump in, you take a look at all the ED2 schools, get a sense of what's out there. Is there a good backup? That informs your ED1 choice. This is all about risk distribution. How risky do I want to be? If I have a good backup in ED2, maybe I get real risky and aggressive in ED1. If I have a terrible backup in ED2, or I don't like any of the schools in ED2, then maybe I get a little more conservative in ED1. This is all part of the application strategy. After we've identified the strategy we will use to apply to college, then we go through the process of building the application. We review, comment, and edit on every aspect of the application. First, generally, the first time we involve ourselves in editing, reviewing, and commenting on something specific is usually in the junior year when the students and their parents get these brag sheets. A lot of high schools now are asking for students and parents to fill out brag sheets that illustrate who the student is from the parent's perspective, who the student is from the student perspective. It is really, really important that the content on those brag sheets complements the narrative you're going to be telling when you apply to college. In my experience, the stuff that parents will often write on those brag sheets are things like, my student is really organized, my son or daughter is really organized, they're studious, hardworking, dedicated. Those are all qualities 
that should not, should not go in a letter of recommendation. We don't care if the student's hardworking. We don't care if they're organized or dedicated. We know that they're dedicated, organized, or hardworking enough based on their success in school, based on their success in research, based on their success in competition. Quite frankly, even if they're not that organized and not that de dedicated, if they are very successful, we still want them. So we don't want to focus on qualities that the universities don't value. What we do want to hear about is what areas of academia are they curious about? What are they passionate about? How do they spend their time and their energy? So we want to re we want to flip the conversation, reconstitute the conversation away from this is hard work and I'm really trying hard to I love learning and I can illustrate my love for learning through these very specific experiences that explored specific areas of academia. That's important because we want consistency in the entire application. If we're saying that in your application, but your guidance counselor and your teachers are telling a different story, that's an inconsistency that often leads to wait lists or rejections. The second part is the common app, common app or the coalition application. You'd be surprised how many red flags there are on a typical application for admission. The first thing we do when we train admissions officers, and I've trained you know, dozens of them throughout my career, is to go through a common app or coalition application and identify red flags things that the university wants to be aware of before they actually make an offer to a student. An example of that might be, let's just say for argument's sake, um, in the supplemental information uh, on the Common App, a student identifies that uh, during their sophomore year, they struggled with an eating disorder. And the reason the student put that in there is because they wanted to illustrate that maybe there was a little dip in grades because of that, and now they've overcome that and they see that as a really positive thing. I struggled with something and now I've overcome it. That's a huge red flag. You don't ever put that down on an application for admission. Even though you may have overcome it, you might be in an amazing space now. It might be a really important part of your personal story. It does not belong on an application for admission because it will likely be circled, highlighted, and it's possible categorized as a possible mental health issue that will make it harder for the student to get in. So we go through every aspect of the application to ensure there are no red flags. The second part is the personal statement or the common application essay. This is the essay that goes to every single college and university that you apply to. It is really important that you are able to uniquely illustrate your personality. When I say uniquely illustrate, just be clear about one thing. It's very, very unlikely that a young student is going to do something that I've never, ever heard a student did before. I mean, I've read thousands, 30,000 applications, right? And there's only so many things a kid can do. It's not about doing things that other people haven't done. It's about having a unique perspective on things that other people have done. It's about creating unique connections between things that other people might not see the connections in. It's about seeing the synergies between disparate activities and disparate areas of academia. It takes time and energy to go through the things you've done in your life, to parse through the details, to dive into the experience and to pull out unique insights. We go through that process with our students because that specific, specific essay will go to every single university and it's really important. The final piece generally of the application for admission are what we refer to as supplemental essays. These are the essays that are specifically written by the admissions office at the institution to which you are applying. And usually those supplemental essay questions change as the leadership at the university changes. For example, when I became the director of admissions at Cornell, the first thing I did was rewrite the supplemental essay question for the College of Arts and Sciences because there were specific qualities and characteristics that I, as the director of admissions, was looking for for our college. And you will see that change as leadership changes. Those supplemental essays are very important. And I might even go so far as to say it's more important than the personal state or the, uh, yeah, the personal statement or the common app essay. And the reason it's more important is because, again, the admissions office specifically wrote the question. They had specific reasons why they wrote the question because they're trying to pull out 
specific pieces of information about a student. And so understanding what it is they're looking for is really important. How do you answer a supplemental essay question? Most essay questions, not all of them, but most of them are asking this. What do you want to study? Why do you want to study it? How did you explore it? And how are you going to contribute once you get to this specific university? In order to answer those questions, I always start with what I refer to as an academic narrative. The academic narrative is basically the timeline from ninth grade, maybe even a little bit earlier, to where we are today. How has the student spent their time as it relates to this specific area of academia? And what we want to do is go through each one, draw out the unique connections, and illustrate how you made the decision to go to the next level. So I started in Science Olympiad, and maybe there was a specific topic in the Science Olympiad competition that led you to possibly, maybe it was an ethics question that came up in Science Olympiad. And that led you to joining the ethics journal at your high school. And that led you to research into how do we engage in the development of medical devices in ethical way. And that's your research project. That's a narrative, a short narrative, but it's a narrative that started with Science Olympiad and ended in a research project, but we need to make the connections so that the reader understands why and how you progressed. Once you have an academic narrative and you, can, you have all the pieces of the puzzle laid out in front of you and you understand all of the connections, now you're ready to sit down and answer a supplemental essay question. Now you're, you're going through what I refer to as a matching process. You're taking what you've done and you're taking what the university offers and you're matching the synergies. I did this specific engagement experience and the university offers that specific research opportunity. I'm ready to contribute to that research opportunity because of my engagement experience. It's a matching process and it is really important that the student understands their academic narrative before they engage in supplemental essay development. Final thoughts here. You know, truthfully, your kids aren't just competing with their friends or even the kids in their school. They're maybe not even the kids in their state. They're competing with students around the world. Success in this process requires a vision. It requires a plan. It requires sacrifice. Do your children have a vision of what they want to accomplish? In my experience, that's literally the most difficult part. They don't understand the vision. Once they understand the vision, do they understand how to enact that vision into real action? Oftentimes, students don't really understand how to engage in real action as it relates to their vision. And finally, do they understand how to illustrate the evidence of their journey? It's not just four years. The networking value at an elite institution truly does last a lifetime and provides significant social and financial value. My final words, stay curious, ask questions about the world around you, identify an area of academic interest, build a specific focus area, develop engagement that's layered in school, out of school, structured, unstructured, and finally start early. I hope you found this presentation to be in interesting and hopefully valuable. And I look forward to uh, answering your questions uh, for a few minutes here after this presentation. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like the questions are starting to roll in here. Question number one. In addition to Cornell, other universities have similar options. I mean, it's easier to change the major within the same college once it gets in. Okay, so first question is, I, I used Cornell University as the case study here. Um, is it similar at other institutions? So what I would say here is first and foremost, you have two different types of institutions. You have national research institutions, and then you have liberal arts colleges. Let's start with the liberal arts colleges because that's what we did not talk about. If you're applying to a small liberal arts college like Amherst, Swarthmore, Bryn Mawr, those schools, there's only one college. There's not multiple. And basically what I said before about flexibility, that applies to that specific experience. So basically, if you apply to Amherst, there's you know, one college underneath that structure, and you can study anything once you get there. 
when we talk about the national research universities, most of the national research universities have multiple colleges underneath them. The most typical three that each that a student will consider are arts and sciences, engineering, and business. So those are usually the three areas that we start with to try and decide where does the student interest in. In regards to how easy is it to move from one college to another, at Cornell University, I would say generally, it depends on what college you're switching from and what year you are and what grades you have. The overall acceptance rate transferring from college to college at Cornell is approximately 55 to 60%, depending on which college you're talking about. And although that's rather high, right? It's not too bad. Remember, you're already in the university. So if you're in the university and you have good grades and you apply to switch colleges and you get rejected, you know, uh, students are often surprised by that, right? Because they're already in the university. Um, each university will be a little bit different. I worked at Lehigh University before Cornell University. The acceptance rate from college to college there was closer to 70%, except when the students were applying to the College of Engineering, because that was the preeminent college at Lehigh. The acceptance rate into that college was closer to 20%. If you look at, say, NYU, uh, trying to transfer from arts and sciences to Stern, or if we look at Penn, saying arts and sciences to Wharton, those would be very, very difficult transfers. So it is institution specific, it depends, but generally the best course of action is to identify the college that gives you the most options that you're interested in, apply there, and then consider whether or not you may have to transfer later on. Um, anything else I want to say about that? I think that's generally it. Uh, I would say this, engineering generally is the hardest, uh, the hardest college to transfer into, and that's because of the sequenced curriculum, right? So because you have to take one class to take the second class, it's very easy to get behind in an engineering curriculum. So those are always difficult to transfer into. Business is also often difficult to transfer into because usually the business colleges are really quite small. So, you know, it's, it's institution specific uh, is kind of the, the general answer. Question two, how does the university rate an applicant's community service effort? Good question. So, the fact of the matter is, and I know this is hard to hear, especially for students, I have clients that have won presidential service awards. They've done hundreds of hours of work. Truthfully, unless that volunteerism is somehow connected to what the student wants to do academically, right? So, you know, hey, I was, I, I'm really interested in public health and I was volunteering in the public health bureau. Okay, that works. But if it's, I was engaged, I, you know, I was volunteering for Habitat for Humanity or I was volunteering at a local soup kitchen, but honestly, it will have literally zero impact on college admissions at highly selective institutions. Maybe at your weaker schools, they might value it to some degree, but at your selective institutions, in all honesty, no one really cares that a student's volunteering in something that's not connected to what they wanna do. In a decade of college admissions selection committees, I have never heard one time a, a, an admissions officer say, well, we should really admit this student because look how much service they engaged in. It almost never happens. So I'm not saying service is a bad thing. Of course, there's value to providing service to your community, but if it's not connected to your area of interest, it won't provide much value. Uh, number three, will any events happening in elementary or middle school be valuable to the academic narrative? Uh, I would say 98% of your application for admission will be focused on things that happen between ninth and 11th grade. In all honesty, I'd say 60% will be focused on things that happen in 10th and 11th grade. Ninth grade is kind of seen as a transitional foundational year, still important, but it's not where you're gonna focus most of your time and energy. Stuff that happened pre ninth grade only serves as the foundation of a narrative, right? So if you're starting your personal statement and maybe something happened in fourth grade that was in fact the foundation, the precursor for what you eventually wanted to do, there might be a couple sentences about it just to kind of bring the reader in, but you will not focus any of your time, the real substance of your application on things that happened pre ninth grade. So in many ways for students who maybe have struggled or maybe they weren't as engaged early on, ninth grade represents a fresh slate, a brand new opportunity to build your narrative, to build your engagement, to build your story and to position yourself as a really strong applicant. Question four, if a student did not have a clear thought on what he wants to do in grade nine, 
Does it mean he has lost the Head Start advantage, therefore much less likely to get into an Ivy League school? If, if true, does that mean that we need to mold ninth grade students to focus on a specific area of interest and spend four years to achieve something which would be for their resume to compete at Ivy League schools? So, you know, one thing you have to understand when you're applying to college uh, is that the threshold, the bar, is not set by the institution, right? The, the competitive bar is not set by Cornell or Columbia or by Yale. It's set by the applicant pool, right? Your competition, the kids in your class, the kids in your state, the kids in your academic area around the world, they are the ones setting your uh, setting the bar of competition. And so what that means is that if a student, if your competition starts early, yes, to some degree you are at, at some level of disadvantage. Now, I think the key here is that most students don't start early, right? So like, you know, most of your competition, 85, 90% of your competition are not going to start early because number one, it's, it's unnatural, right? Like, in ninth grade, most ninth graders have no clue what they want to do. I certainly didn't know what I wanted to do in ninth grade. So it's an unnatural thing to be forced to focus so early. But remember, when I say focus, I'm not saying let's focus on what this ninth grader is going to do for the rest of their life. That would be silly. I mean, you know, we all change our mind. They're probably going to change their mind in college. What I'm saying is let's focus early on how we want to build your application for admission so that when it's time, you have the evidence and the compelling narrative you need to put yourself in a position to do what you actually want to do. So yes, I do think starting very early is important. I think, you know, can you start in ninth, in 10th grade? Yes, because again, most of your competition won't start in ninth because they don't know about this type of stuff. Can you start in 11th grade? In many instances, you still can, but you're, each, each year that passes, each day that passes, you're at a slightly less competitive advantage than you would have been had you started the day before. I would also say the later you start, if you, if, let's just say for argument's sake, uh, I meet a student in ninth grade and they say, you know, John, I love computer science and I really want to major in computer science. And I say to them, well, just so you know, it's really competitive. I think you should move to data science. And they think about it. We go through the whole thing. They see the similarities between data science and computer science. They see the differences between data science and computer science. And they come back and they say, John, I hear what you're saying. There is some overlap between data science and computer science. I just really don't want to spend any time doing anything I don't want to do. And data science will have some components of things I don't want to do. I'd really like to focus on computer science. OK. If they start really early, you can do that and still go into a competitive area like computer science. I would say if you identify computer science in ninth grade, then we have three years to build evidence. And when I say build evidence, I mean build specific evidence, right? You're not gonna apply as a computer science major. You're gonna apply as a computer science major focused on, on encryption. You're not gonna apply as a computer science major. You're gonna apply as a computer science major focused on uh, machine learning. Now we've identified a more specific area. That takes time. You know, you can't just decide in 11th grade, oh, I like computer science and I'm going to focus on machine learning. There's, an, there's a buildup, an evolution. There's a narrative and a foundation that needs to be built. So in the most competitive areas, you need to start early. If you, if you, let's just say we have an 11th grader here today and they're like, well, Jesus, I didn't start early. Now what? My suggestion would be you have to move away from the most competitive areas then. You can't apply to pre-med or computer science with no real engagement in that area and expect to start in 11th grade. In that instance, we find a less competitive area where the bar, the threshold of competition will be lower, and thus we're able to create the evidence you need quicker and still give you a, a chance of competing at the highly selected schools. So I hope that helped. Basically what we're saying is the most competitive areas, you absolutely have to start early. The less competitive areas, you can start a little later, but you need very focused engagement quickly at the end of that process. Okay, um, next question. My kid got a B plus in calculus. Others are all A's. Would it be a deal breaker for elite engineering schools? I believe um, on the supplemental application for the College of Engineering at Cornell, 
one of the questions that they ask is what level, uh, what level math did you get to? That level math, that question they ask you, that's a moving average, meaning that you know, if 75% of the applicant pool took Calc BC, then that's now the, the bar, right? If only 30% of the applicant pool took Calc BC, now then maybe Calc AB is the bar. So that changes year over year, but as it relates to engineering, there will be a hyper-focus on your math skills. The, the focus generally is on what level math you got to, and then the second part is what grade you got. I think the question of whether a B plus would kill you depends on what calculus class it was. Are we talking about differential equations? Are we talking about you know, pre-calc or even calc AB? Uh, if it was in a lower level calc, I think a B plus at a uh, elite engineering school would, would in fact likely be very difficult to overcome unless you had a very compelling overall narrative. Uh, if that B plus was in differential equations or maybe it was in calc AB, but you took the AP exam at the end and got a five, well, then maybe that B plus wouldn't necessarily have too much of a negative impact. So it kind of depends a little bit. Uh, question number six, um, if not applying to music major, does it mean any music experience will not help with the college application? I know this is hard to hear, but in short, yes, uh, that's pretty much exactly what it means. Uh, now, there are some institutions that allow uh, non-prospective music majors to, to actually audition. And so if you are a fantastic pianist, but you don't plan to apply as a music major, because that's not what you want to study in college, but the university offers a, an audition, I would suggest you do that because sometimes the universities are in fact still looking for strong musicians, um, even if they're not going to be music majors. But if you never audition, right? So you're not applying as a music major and you never had the opportunity to audition, then I would say, yes, it's true. But none of the music engagement is going to have any real, real impact in your admission decision. Will colleges be taking into account how COVID impact current high school students, especially those wanting to become any pre-health majors? Many extracurriculars related to medicine sciences were not available to my daughter due to the pandemic this past year. So I guess what I would say there is I go back to the colleges, the universities, the administrators, of course, we 100%, we, I say we, because I you know, feel like I still work there to some degree, I talk about this every day, but the, the administrators, we recognize what you went through because everyone went through, right? We all know how terrible it was. So of course, there's going to be some level of understanding, but remember this, the understanding doesn't really matter because the bar is set by your competition. Right. And so if your competition did engage, right, maybe maybe they lived in a different part of the world where it wasn't as bad, maybe or more likely, maybe they were really motivated and they did a lot of stuff virtually. Right. Most of my clients have continued to engage in either research or industry related projects virtually with mentors during the pandemic. And the reason that happened is because, well, number one, they were working with me, of course. Right. And I told them to do it. And, and, and one of the reasons I told them to do it was because I recognize exactly what you just noted, which is many extracurriculars were not available. And so now anything you do is actually more valued than it ever has been before, right? Because less people were actually able to engage. Now your engagement is more valuable, even if it wasn't the most compelling engagement in the world. So what I would say is that we understand, they're gonna understand, but you still gotta do something. And you know you can explore from your from your computer, right? You can check out websites. You can check out your public health bureau. You could, you know, find discrepancies in data and write an article to your local newspaper. Those are the types of things that motivated students who want to go to highly selective schools do. And I think you got to do it if you want to have a chance at the most selective institutions. Question eight: How to get admission to business schools at Ivy Ivy League universities? Here's the thing, getting admitted to any program, whether it's finance, computer science, biology, or Greek literature, it's generally all the same. It's not different. It's about layering evidence that you're interested, that you're curious, that you explored, and that you're ready to contribute. And then the second piece of that is depth and specificity, right? So 
you know, if a student wants to apply as a psychology major, right? One of my clients, are, they're never going to apply as a psychology major because psychology is a huge major. Lots of kids, anybody who's ever been intrigued by the brain, right? Or by the way people make decisions, say, oh, maybe I'll be interested in psychology. And so you get tons of applicants in that area. How do you differentiate yourself? You differentiate yourself by getting specific. So my students aren't going to apply as psychology majors. They're going to apply as, you know, behavioral, developmental behavioral psychology or social psychology or cognitive psychology. Now we're creating specificity and depth. I would say the same thing is true in business. We don't want students focused on, you know, okay, I'm going to apply as a finance major. Okay, great. What's the subsection under finance? Maybe it's corporate finance. Maybe it's decentralized finance. Maybe it's the intersection of technology and finance. We want to find something specific and unique and build your application like almost like a grad school student application. It's specific like a case study. Through this very specific exploration of decentralized finance, we are able to illustrate the student's interest in quote unquote business as a whole. But the specificity of their project differentiates them and illustrates their ability to contribute. So the question of how do I get admission? It's get, it's identify your, your prospective major, identify a subtopic under it, and explore that subtopic in great depth. That will give you a significantly better chance of earning an offer of admission. Uh, next one is which one is harder to get in? at Cornell, the School of Arts and Sciences, or the School of Engineering for a Chinese male student. So um, College of Arts and Sciences is the largest, meaning that it has the most applications. So from a total number of applications perspective, Cornell Arts and Sciences is in fact more selective from a total acceptance rate perspective. From an SAT perspective, uh, the College of Engineering has higher math score standardized testing. So they have overall, I think their SAT scores are about 10 points higher overall, maybe 10, possibly 20, than the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, I would say it's impossible for me to answer that question right now without knowing what the student has done. Uh, I, if, if the student has done, say, let's just say they're in ninth grade, they've done nothing, and they're just saying which one's easier, I would say probably the College of Arts and Sciences would be easier. And the reason for that would be there's more flexibility for me as a consultant to help direct the student into less competitive areas to get in. In engineering, most of the applicants will come in through mechanical engineering or computer engineering, um, but it's not like there are areas of engineering that are significantly easier or more underrepresented. So I guess just from a strategy perspective, it probably makes more sense to go to the College of Arts and Sciences, but let's just say the student is already in the 10th or 11th grade and they've been in a robotics club and they've done you know, things that lean you to make you think that they sound like an engineering student, then you really should apply to the engineering college because the College of Arts and Sciences is very, very aware of fit. So if a kid sounds like an engineering student, if a kid sounds like a business student, they will not take them. And I know that because as you know, I was the director. I hired most of the staff that's there. I listened to all of their conversations and fit is really important to them. They're ex-faculty at Cornell, right? These are, these are PhDs with, with, uh, that advise students in this college. And so they hate the idea of getting a student that really is interested in business or engineering who ends up in arts and sciences. So fit is really important. You have to know what they're looking for and you have to make sure your story fits that. Uh, my son likes robotics. His math is average. What path? or major will help him get into a top school? Any suggestions, case studies? You know, the fact of the matter is robotics is, is, falls under engineering. And no matter what, there's going to be a focus on math curriculum if you want to go to a top tier school. I would say, you know, at some point you have to make a decision, right? Like if my math really isn't strong, then maybe robotics is something I do, but maybe it's not going to be my major. Maybe it's something I do as a hobby, or maybe it's going to be a minor, or maybe it's a club I'll be part of. But the fact of the matter is you're not going to be able to move into engineering with a weak math curriculum. So either you accept a lower tier school, which is okay, and you could still you know, do very well, obviously, in the real world, or generally change direction so that you don't focus on your math because you're applying as an, or they don't focus on your math because you're applying as an engineering student.
Um, does the number of AP courses matter? Yes, it does. So in general, the total number of advanced courses is super important in this process. You know, it's funny, almost every college and university says the same thing. They all say, we don't treat you as a number. But if you walked into an admission selection committee, the first thing they do is refer to these kids as numbers. And the numbers they use to refer to students are this. They will say, this kid's a zero, two, four, four. What does that mean? That means that when they're referring to the zero, two, four, four, those are four numbers, right? Those represent each year, freshman year, sophomore year, junior year, senior year. And the zero is your freshman year, the two is your sophomore year, the four is your junior year, the other four is your senior year. And what we're saying when we say you're a zero, two, four, four is that's your advanced level courses. So if you're an AP curriculum, you took zero AP courses your freshman year, two your sophomore year, four your junior year, four your senior year. Now you're a zero, two, four, four. That's 10 total AP courses. Now imagine for a moment, you're a zero, two, four, four. Now, colleges and universities read applications by school group, meaning that the kids from your high school will be read right alongside you, right? Because it doesn't make sense to read your application and then take some kid from Montana and read his application because you have fundamentally different experiences. So what we do is we take similar students and we compare similar students to similar students. The first thing we look at is high school. So now we get back to the idea of your 0244 and, then, and we read that application and we might say, put the kid in the hold pile, right? Meaning they could, they could be offered, they could be waitlisted. I don't know, I need to see more information. I need to see the rest of the applicant. Pool. So I take them, I put them in the hold pile. Now I pull the next kid up from your high school and this kid is a 0255, right? They have two additional AP courses, one in their junior year, one in their senior year. Immediately now, you are at some level of a disadvantage as it relates to curriculum, right? Your academic rigor, is disadvantaged compared to someone who goes to your high school who's applying to this specific institution. That's not overly easy to overcome. Now, if that student is applying to computer science and you're applying as a sociology student, well, then maybe there's a little bit less comparison between your 0244 and their 0255. But AP total number is really important. The other thing is that you can self-study these AP tests. I would encourage you to self-study AP tests. And the reason I would encourage you to do it is that it's, it's a high reward, low risk activity. If you take an AP class in high school and you take the exam and you get a two, well, you know, I would suggest you don't put that down in your application because a two looks really bad. But let's just say you, you get a two on lots of them, right? You, you, you take six AP exams and you get a two on three of them and you get a three on three of them. You can't just not put down three AP exams. That's a red flag right there, right? The college and university can say, took six AP classes, you only took three AP exams. What happened here? So you can probably get away without putting one down, but you're not going to get away without putting three down. So the key here is if we compare that to self studying AP exams, let's just say, for argument's sake, you take six AP classes in high school, you take all the exams, you do okay, you put them all down. Then you self-study for three AP exams yourself outside of school, one year after sophomore or one after sophomore year, one in the middle of, I'm sorry, one before sophomore year, one in the middle of sophomore year, and one in junior year. And you self-study, you take the AP exam by yourself. Let's just say you do poorly. It's kind of nothing lost, right? Because no one even knows you took that exam. You don't put it down in your application. And yes, you lost the time that you put into it, but it's not going to negatively impact you. If you do amazingly well and you get fives on all of them and you put it down in your application, the reader is going to say, well, they got all these fives on these exams. That's incredible. They look at your transcript. You didn't take the class. Now it looks even better. And if you have the opportunity, um, it's called Inside the Decision Room at Amherst. It's like seven years old. It's a YouTube video. It's inside the selection room. And the dean of admissions there, the first thing they say in this video is, oh, wow, this kid self-studied for AP exams. That's cool, right? And that's, I've heard that in every admission selection committee I've ever been in. So AP total number is important and self-studying is a very viable strategy to increase that number without negatively impacting you if you don't do incredibly well. Will a grade of B plus in English significantly impact the chances of getting into top technical institutes such as MIT and Caltech? Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's a very difficult for me to answer just kind of with one grade in one class, not knowing what year or, or what level class and what the rest of the application looks like. 
But in the end, I would say, you know, at Cornell University, um, we used to, we, we, most selective schools chart your transcript, meaning, you know, a lot of kids will say, what GPA do I need to get into that college? That, that doesn't exist. There is no GPA to get into an Ivy League school because every high school is different. So a 4.0 does not mean the same thing as a 4.0 at another school. And translating a 100 scale to a 4.0 scale or even an 8.0 scale to a 4.0 scale is very difficult to do. Most admissions officers are not capable of it, quite honestly. And so GPA at most selective institutions is really not looked at. We chart your transcript. We say, okay, show me the four years, right? One, two, three, four. Show me all the academic areas. And then we, from a visual representation, we chart out how you challenged yourself. So we can see, here's where the, this kid challenged themselves in all STEM areas on a graphic representation. Now I know right away that this kid should be interested in STEM. If the answer, if I look at their app and it doesn't look like that, then I know that's a problem. So we're charting transcripts. And the grades that are being noted, so at Cornell University, when, when you chart that transcript, the only thing that's written down is are grades that are below A, right? Because literally most of the kids that are getting accepted have mostly A's, right? I mean, so if a kid has a B or below, that is noted. In fact, A minuses are generally noted. So I guess what I would say is a B plus in English at MIT or Caltech is absolutely going to be noted. Does that mean you can't get in? No, not necessarily. It depends on the rest of the context. But a B plus at a school like that will be noted because most of the students who are accepted will have mostly A's. It doesn't mean that they don't have any B's, but they will have mostly A's. Will criteria for acceptance different, differ from private high school students and public high school students? Will private high school students compete only with other private high school students? So uh, yes, it, it, it's different. It's a little different. Um, generally, you know, if you're super smart, right? It doesn't matter whether you go to public school or private school. It's really generally irrelevant as it relates to like the really the best of the best. When you get into the private schools, the value of the private schools, in my opinion, is when you get to the kids who are like, you know, like a little above average, right? They're good kids. They take, they're strong kids. They study hard. They're not, they're not amazing. You know, they're at least intellectually or academically, they're not doing um, earth shattering things, but they're good kids. Those type students do benefit generally from private schools because, because at elite private schools, the universities are willing to dip a little lower in the class because of the rigorous preparation. So, you know, you're more willing to take a kid that's in the top, say, 25% of a, of a really strong private high school than you might be to take someone in the top 25% of a rather weak public school. So, yes, there is a difference. Um, but I would say for most of the students that get into highly selective schools, you, most of them are quite intelligent, right? And they would do well in a public or private school. And generally it doesn't have too, too, too much impact. But for those kind of like above average kids, the private schools do provide some advantage. And I think the real advantage in all honesty is the guidance counselors, to be honest with you, because the guidance counselors at the elite prep schools, oftentimes they have either worked in college admissions, at least to some degree, or they're networking with college admissions officers. Like we go out to every single year. I actually have, a, I just wrote an article about this. Uh, it was entitled Guidance Counselors, More Power Than You Know. And guidance counselors have a lot of power because not only do they write a letter of recommendation, but we network with these people. Every year, there's a national association of college admissions counselors, uh, a, a conference. And all the guidance counselors from all the best high schools and all of the admissions people from all the elite universities all go to this and they network. And what happens is later on, months later, after, you know, we were out there grabbing dinner with each other and, you know, sharing stories, you get a phone call, right? Like, hey, John, it's Sally from blank high school. It was great seeing you out in Colorado last year. I got this amazing kid at my high school. You know, they applied. I just want to you know, make sure that you're aware because I think they're a great kid. Could you give them, a, you know, give them an extra look? That happens literally all the time from private schools. And so that's really the value of these prep private schools. They can get admissions people on the phone and they can advocate on the student's behalf. How, how, do, students, how do students change their major after admission? Remember what I said before, once you're admitted, the day you walk onto that campus, you have no major, 99% of the colleges, you have no major. You're a prospective major. 
And for the next year and a half, you will, although you'll meet with an advisor and talk about what you're going to do, you might even start taking some classes in that area. You're still not that major. So even when I say switch majors, when you get there, I don't even really mean switch. I simply mean, you don't even have to switch. You simply just declare a different major when it's time. The, the switching aspect, I guess, would simply be tell your advisor. So the first time you meet your advisor, you'd say, hey, on my application, I put down data science, but over the summer, I changed my mind. I think I'm gonna go with computer science. And the advisor, advisor would just note it in the system and that would be the it. If you have already declared your major, right? So now we're talking about you're already sophomore in college or you're actually switching colleges. Now it's an actual application process. You have to fill out a whole form. It goes to somebody for review and they will make an actual admissions decision. Um, let's see here. Does academic competition achievement still carry weight this year? Yes, even, even though things are virtual uh, and, and you could argue the integrity of the, of the competitions are questionable. You know, one of the things you have to understand is this, you know, um, competitions. I, 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 if you walked into Stanford's admissions office today and you got all the admissions office officers in one room and you said, and you pulled them, you said, um, for math-based competitions, could you each write down the top three? I would bet you a lot of money that most of the admissions officers couldn't even name three. And I would bet you a lot of money that if they did, that there would be very little overlap. Like there might be one, maybe two competitions that a few of them recognize because they're the best. But outside of that, you won't see much understanding of the competitions. Why is that? People are surprised by that. I just watched a presentation by somebody from the University of Chicago who literally couldn't name one competitive uh, experience in the space that the kid was asking about. And the reason for that is because we do engage in a holistic review. It's not like when we pull up an application, we look at the competition and say, well, they won that competition, game over, we don't have to read anything anymore. It's, they're all pieces of a puzzle. And so the competitions are still valuable because they are a piece of the puzzle. If you do really well, yeah, we might think that there's questionable, the integrity of the competition might be questionable compared to the year before, but it's just one little piece of the puzzle. And if the rest of that story is telling us the same thing, right? We're saying, okay, this kid won this math competition and they happen to be president in a math club and they founded a social justice math program, right? Well, now all the story fits together and that competition added some value because it was a piece of that story. Um, so yes, they're still valuable, but they aren't, they're not something you can lean on by themselves. You know, there aren't admissions readers out there that are just going to say like, well, that's the company, unless you win a national competition, you're number one. Sure, most people know that that's amazing. But outside of that, you really, the value is in the way you describe your ability and what you learned through it, right? Like you don't win a competition without understanding something. And that depth of understanding is what gets you in the way you describe it in your applications for admission. My son got a 1520. 800 math, he's interested in getting into Cornell. Do you think that's good enough or does he need to retake it? You know, I think one thing that's really important to recognize is that the climate of, of standardized tests has changed dramatically. Um, you know, let me just uh, quickly kind of give you a quick overview. In college admissions, in higher education in general, things move so, so slowly. You want to make a change, it takes forever because the administration has to get on board, the faculty has to get on board, the board of trustees has to get on board. And then after all that, they always ask the same question. What are the other universities doing, right? So if Cornell wants to do something like, let's just say uh, they wanna add early decision two, which we talked about while I was there. The first question was asked when I got to the board of trustees meeting was, does Penn do it? Does Brown do it? Does Harvard do it, right? They all want to make sure that they're in good company with the other schools. Because of that, because everything moves so slowly, I was blown away by how quickly the dynamic changed as it relates to standardized tests this past year. What happened was COVID hit, kids couldn't sit for the test, and now the universities were in a position where they had to, right? There was no way around it. They had to accept test optional policies. Now, what are the benefits of test optional policies? Number one, to the college, as you can imagine, SATs are an obstacle to applying. So if a kid gets a 1,200 on the SAT, most kids know that they're not going to Harvard now. 
right? Like they know that. But if you never take the SAT and your grades are really good, then you might think you do have a shot at Harvard, right? And so that's why you saw so many more applications last year than we've ever seen before, because they were not being filtered, but themselves filtering themselves by their own SAT scores and comparing it to what the university has. So applications went up significantly. Now the colleges, and, and the other part that's important to recognize is not only did overall applications go up, but your underrepresented minority applications went up, right? So your black and Hispanic, your low income students, they all were able to apply to more selective schools than they ever have before because of the test optional and the test blind policies. What happened was the colleges were first forced to make decisions and they made decisions that ended up with more diverse classes because they had more underrepresented minorities in the applicant pool and they weren't forced to show everybody these lower SAT scores like they would have been in the past. So it was easier to accept those kids. Right now, the universities are starting the process of figuring out how they're going to evaluate whether or not those were good decisions, right? Were the optional decisions good decisions? And the way they're gonna do that is they're gonna say, here's, our, here's the kids who submitted SAT scores. Here's the kids who didn't submit SAT scores. Let's look at how they did. What are the, what's the average GPA of the freshman year of that group? versus the average GPA of the freshman year of this group. If those are similar, you're gonna see a lot of test optional policies stay and maybe even move to test blind or get rid of it. If you see significant differences, that's when you'll see colleges lean back into standardized tests. To this question of a 1520, I would say in this year, where especially at Cornell, where some of the colleges are actually test blind, but the College of Arts and Sciences and the College of Engineering are test optional, I would say 1520, especially in the ED round, is enough. And that's because there's less focus on the standardized test than there ever has been before. In the RD round, I still think they'll still use it as a filtering function. So you know, it'd be better to have a higher score than 1520, especially. So that means you have a 720 in the SAT, critical reading. Um, you know, each college generally has a cutoff, right? They'll say, you know, if you get below a 700 in the critical reading, you're being read by a different type of reader, seasonal reader. So I would say 1520 this year is probably enough, especially in the ED round. And for the, our younger students out there, we really need to sit down and think about strategy, right? If, if a school offers a test optional policy, do we use it, do we not? In the past, Asian students really, and white students really could not take advantage of test optional policies. They were for underrepresented minorities. That has changed. And so we got to sit down and think about that strategy. We look at your score, we look at the middle 50 percentile of the school you're applying to, and then we make a decision as to whether or not it's worth it to submit the test score or to retake the test as needed. Okay. Um, if my child is has Kate has built cases in math and math competitions for years, but she's interested in pre-med. Is this something off? And is she still on the pre-med track? Let me just be clear about something. This is free advice for every single person out there. You do not, you just don't, unless you are the best of the best, you do not put down pre-med on an application for admission. And when I say don't put down pre-med, I mean the student doesn't identify it as their prospective major. I mean the student doesn't note note. On the Common App, for example, there's a drop down list that says, What are your future plans, like career plans? You don't put physician down there. And most importantly, you make sure that your guidance counselor and your teacher do not ever write in that letter of recommendation, Susie will make a great physician one day. Because even if everything that we talk about is we don't want pre med, we don't want pre med, and your teacher doesn't know that, and they put down, Oh, she'll make a great physician. If, you, if she says that and you did not identify yourself as pre-med, game over, you will not get in. So everything has to be consistent in that application to ensure that it's being read appropriately the right way. But if you can make sure that your guidance counselor, your teacher, and you are not saying pre-med in your application, you should not put it down. The reason for that, at Cornell and the College of Arts and Sciences, we literally had 35% of all of the applicants identify themselves as pre-med. If you put yourself in that group, you're gonna be compared to every single one of those people. And that puts you in a highly competitive, very difficult space. Pre-med is not even a major, just to be clear. It's a track, right? So identifying yourself as pre-med is literally of no value at all whatsoever. So if you're interested in pre-med, you need to sit down with you know, either yourself, do your own research or sit down with a mentor and 
understand how you can do pre-med without identifying yourself as pre-med. This question though is about mathematics and math is universal in that it's gonna be valued and it doesn't really take away from anything. So, you know, quite frankly, even if you said I want Greek literature, as long as there was tons of evidence in Greek literature, the math could still stay there because math is so fundamental to literally everything. And it wouldn't hurt for pre-med, computer science, data science, sociology, psychology, math would be a value in all those spaces. The only thing you shouldn't do is identify yourself as pre-med because that would just hurt. Them. And maybe you guys saw the article, it's called the Fauci effect when, uh, you know, Fauci was, became kind of like a mini celebrity during the coronavirus. And that actually increased the number of pre-med students that were applying. So it's actually gotten even more competitive. Uh, my daughter wants to major in economics. I know many students are applying to this major and it's competitive. What are alternative majors similar to this? So we can use strategy to get in to college first and then transfer later. So one of the things that's very interesting about economics is that it, it's the bridge between business and arts and sciences, right? So in, in, business, in a business school, you're gonna see economics and finance, and in a college of arts and sciences, you're also gonna see economics. So when you talk about econ, you can go both directions. You really, you know, in this situation, uh, I would wanna sit down with a student to get a sense of, you know, can we, could we do the arts and sciences route, right? Meaning that, you know, maybe we can move the student into something like public policy to apply and then be an econ major in arts and sciences, that would work if that's kind of the direction they want to go. But if they say like, oh, well, I said econ, but I really want finance. Well, that's not the same thing. And finance doesn't live in the College of Arts and Sciences. So in that situation, you would want to apply to a business school to ensure that you could actually study finance when you get there. So it depends on which college we are talking about for econ. And what I would do then is once we identify the college, find a program, get super specific under that program, layer all the evidence. That's generally how it would go. Uh, what makes Cornell College of Arts and Sciences different from other top schools? You know, I'm, I'm not here to push the College of Arts and Sciences from Cornell. You know, I, I obviously was the director of admissions there, but, um, you know, I just use that as an example. I think, in my opinion, to be honest with you, um, colleges are businesses. Right? They are. I mean, you know, we say they're not for profit, but we have billions and billions of dollars of endowment. And it's just like any other business. Uh, you know, if we're at Cornell and we see you know, lots of kids are interested in the X program at University of Pennsylvania. You know, the people at Cornell aren't saying, well, geez, I wish we had that. They go get it, right? They make it themselves. So I would say most of the differences, uh, most of it truly are, is marketing, right? It's really marketing. Like we're trying at the university levels and the colleges, we're trying to differentiate ourselves to give students understanding of our value but when it's all said and done, what are the real differences between these institutions? Generally, their ge geography, the physical differences of the campus, the overall size of the campus, the makeup of the student body, are they highly competitive? Are they more collaborative? Um, and then the diversity of the student body. I mean, those are generally, from my perspective, the differences. Outside of that, like even the programmatic rankings, oh, this, this uh, history department's ranked higher than that history department. You know, I would argue that that's mostly marketing ploys by things like U.S. News and World Report, and even the universities trying to develop a message to get kids interested in, in their programs. My child took four AP tests during middle school and got five on all four. Was that a bad idea? My child took four AP tests during middle school and got a five on all four. No, I mean, that's, an, that's amazing and not a bad idea at all. I mean, I think uh, that will be very impressive to college and universities that took four AP tests for high school and got a five on all of them. And that's, that's pretty impressive. And that, you know, I think that puts you on the track to, you know, assuming you put, you know, find a specific area of interest, and create that narrative and all the depth that puts you on track to a very selective school. Honors classes, do they matter or not? At the most selective schools, I would say not really, you know, they're really focused on AP or in an IB curriculum, your higher level IB courses. Um, as you go down the list, right, in, in, of selectivity, I'd say like, you know, when I worked at Cornell, our acceptance rate was about 10%. When I was at Lehigh, our acceptance rate was about 25 to 30%. At Cornell, we never noted uh, an, an honors course. At Lehigh University, we noted honors courses, but there was still focus on AP. I would say when you get to acceptance rates that are closer to like say 50%, uh, that's when you will, that's when you'll hit, um, that's when you'll see students start, to, or, or admissions officers start noting uh, honors courses. 
Okay, we have a ton of questions here. I, I won't be able to get through all of them. Um, let me just kind of, I'm gonna should pick a couple more um, that maybe are related to most people. And then if you guys have additional questions, please reach out to your, uh, your specific representative, uh, STEM Ivy or Ivy Circle, and they can get you in touch with me or one of our counselors and we can answer these questions for you. Um, one question here about, is about legacy status. Just to be clear, if you apply as a legacy student, you really need to apply ED. That's the only time they really focus on legacy. Um, let's see here. Just looking for kind of a universal questions that might help. Um, super scoring. Um, most of you know, the universities are now, oh, almost every university is super scoring SATs now. There was a while where they weren't super scoring ACTs, mostly because ACT didn't give the guidance on how to do it. They now have done that. So most schools are super scoring. You have to remember, the universities want you to have the highest standardized test you can possibly have, right? Because that's what they report to their faculty, their board of trustees, their blah, blah, blah. So they have a vested interest in getting your score as high as possible. At the most, most competitive schools, you will start to see distinctions between, oh, this kid took the test once and this kid took the test three times, right? So, you know, I would say at Cornell, we started to have those conversations where we, we would kind of be parsing the total number of times a student took it. I would say in this climate, there's probably less focus on that just because SATs are less important than there ever have been, but most of the schools do super score. Foreign languages, um, you know, a, a lot of elite schools, especially colleges of arts and sciences, ask for, for either three or four years of a foreign language or three consecutive years of the same language. You should look at that even early on. A lot, a lot of kids, you know, they don't look at it until it's time to apply and they took two years. And, you know, even the schools that say they require three or four years often will accept kids with two years if they're overly compelling. But if you're not overly compelling, it's really easy just to say, well, they don't meet the requirement, move them out. So it's important to take a look at schools that you might be interested in what their foreign language requirements are. Nobody cares about SAT or ACT, which one? So you can take the ACT or SAT. I always suggest sit down, take a practice test, get a sense of which one is which and what you like. Once you have a feeling for which one fits you better, that's when you engage in prep, uh, you know, in meaningful prep. Anything else here? Um, the last question, it, PSAT scores, I know that in high school, there's a lot of focus on PSAT scores, but at the college level, they're never brought up and you cannot just use a PSAT score in, in, instead of an SAT score. So PSATs really don't have much place in college admissions. The only other thing I'll note is that, um, what are they, SAT subject tests, SAT twos, if you will. Um, they used to be, uh, again, a, a filtering function, mostly for Asian and white students at highly selective schools. SAT subject tests are basically non-existent. The, the, the college board has gotten rid of them. If you've taken them in the past, they will not be reviewed at 99% of the institutions that you apply to. So that's kind of gone away. And when you get rid of a data point like SAT subject tests, what happens? That becomes more focus on the remaining data points. Ladies and gentlemen, this was an absolute pleasure. I hope this was helpful and informative. If you have additional questions, I would love to. You know, chat with you guys directly. Please reach out to your um, to your representatives and uh, get in touch if you have additional questions. The last thing I'll say is start early, stay curious, motivate yourself to explore. And when it's all said and done, you need to think about the end game early. What, how do you plan to apply? And how do you think you will be able to illustrate your ability to contribute to that specific area of academia at that specific university when it's all said and done. I wish you guys all the best. I hope everything goes well for you during, as we kind of break out of this coronavirus and move back into the world and start engaging and exploring again. This is an exciting time for students. I hope uh, you're as excited about it as I am. And I hope you found this informative. Thank you everyone.